Thanks, Brian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm happy happy uh, you joined. You came uh, came to this talk. Um, I hope you find it interesting and useful. Um, so I'm Nimbus. I work at Bloomberg on Spark infrastructure, and Bloomberg, in case you hadn't heard of it, is the premier solution for um, for for data platform and uh, training solutions for financial professionals. Um, there are a lot of data sets coming in, and people care about getting them up to the millisecond and having them be very correct and stable. Um, and there's also just a lot of data that ends up piling around from a lot of different places. So some of the things that people want to do with that are interesting and useful batch pipelines. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, things that can be done to make the development process of these batch pipelines uh, easier and faster. And one of the main ways that that can be done is with the introduction of automatic checkpointing. Um, so this is the kind of problem that I'm talking about. Um, it is a data pipeline. It's relatively simpler than some of these other kinds of like continuous applications, such as like streaming or just the whole integration. We're just talking about um, we have some data somewhere. We want to run a process over it in order to save some output. And that might actually be um, a pretty big thing. Um, this, you know, kind of from the outside, it's relatively simple and constrained, but it could be a very large amount of data, and we could be doing very complicated things with it. Um, so, uh, uh, so now, when we're doing this with Spark, um, this is the sort of development cycle um, we're usually in. And this is, I'm talking more about um, doing this with a project where you generate a jar and ship your code to a cluster and run some, something with Spark Submit. So this is not um, with a notebook, although you could invoke this from a notebook. But the key thing here is that when you have um, a change you want to make, that is you see something that either it's broken currently or it's not producing what you want it to be, and you have to make a change. You're making a change in your library. And for you to see the effects of that change, you really need to redeploy your change and s switch over to a new context. If you're just making a quick little change in a notebook, you would, could do that in the same context, and that's convenient. But if you are changing out your library code, you really have to restart this whole thing. And there's um, certainly the first two, two spots here. That's basically, that's the work you want to be doing. That can take an indeterminate amount of time, and that's really up to you. But these other parts are something where that's really where we're just waiting around, kind of. And when you're deploying a jar, you can get that down to about a minute. You, when, you're, um, when you're starting a new, a new session, that's on the order of a minute. Um, and then, but typically, the part where we tend to wait a long time is for, uh, for a job to actually go, to run the distributed computation um, over a, perhaps a very large data set. And this, you know, this could take a few minutes. This could take some hours, depending on the situation. Um, so that's usually the place where we could shave some time off. Um, so going back to the data pipeline, if we have some kind of output that we want to produce by running a process over a source, um, you know, we just see, you know, we just imagine we would just run that for the first time and see how it goes. And then sometimes something like this will happen, where it breaks in a very mysterious way. Um, and we're kind of left wondering, oh, what, what should we do now? So uh, if, you, if this goes and happens and it only took like a minute or so to happen, um, that's OK. We can go and make some changes, redeploy it, rerun it, and keep poking at it until it does what we want. Um, but if this is something that happens after like 20 minutes or an hour, that, that's kind of a problem. We don't really want to be like monkey patching something that takes that long to run. So you would want to be pretty careful about the changes and do that in a systematic way. Um, and that can, be, that can be difficult. So, um, and you know, say, even if, even if we're not running into some mysterious error, um, we could have something where it's not producing what we expect. And we want it, and we want to figure it out, and we, have to, we don't really have much of a choice except to keep running this. So, this is something that people will do in order to address that. So instead of having a single entry point where we just run the whole thing from start to finish, people will start to introduce stages into their pipeline 
where they have um, multiple entry points. So um, imagine that the first stage is something that is relatively simple but time consuming, like we join in multiple data sets in order to produce some kind of denormalized objects. And then in stage two, we might do more complicated things with them that are more prone to change. Um, so since we, if we're not really changing the first part and we're running into issues in the second part, we don't really want to run the first part every time. So that's why people will go and do something like this, where they'll save the output of the first part in some location and then have the second stage read from that and, um, and do, do the rest of, of the thing. And then if we go and we can tinker and, and iterate and on stage two, and it doesn't really take us very long because we're not rerunning the whole thing every time. We're only running the part we care, the part that has new things in it. Um, so there are problems we've introduced by doing something like this. So we're, we're doing this because we want to save time while we're changing things. Um, but we've introduced um, potentially time-wasting problems because what if, what if we go and realize, well, for the most part, stage one is fine. It seems to be running fine. But then we discover a problem in stage two um, or that is really because of something that we're doing in stage one that we need to change. Um, so if we go and change stage one, we need to either overwrite the output um, or write to a new output and make sure stage two picks that up. And that's not, you know, that's not a huge problem. That's not like the worst thing in the world. But it is additional friction that we'll have to worry about. And it's also, it's, it's easy to make a mistake in that area. We might, um, so one of the things that can happen is if you go and make the change and you run it and it saves to a new place, what if the second stage is still reading from the old place? It's a very simple mistake, but it still, ha it still happens. Um, and, and also, especially if you have, say, multiple people working on something that's overlapping. If you kind of have some iteration of like, here's the intermediate results from th something, and then you have people working on off of different versions, they have slightly different things of that, you can run into problems where you think you're going off of uh, a previously saved intermediate results that are the ones you want, but that is not always the case. Um, so what would we would like is if, there was a system that just handled this for us and did the right thing, so we didn't have to think about where we're saving these intermediate results and when we're, when we're using which ones of them. Um, so it would be nice if we could just write it as if it were one thing, but we just had the benefits of it loading something without having to do the redundant computation. Um, so what we would want is for stage one to run some of the time, for it to save its output and when the output is already present, um, we, just want, um, we just want it to go straight into stage two without having to run stage one again. Um, so, so the first time it runs, we would like it to do this. So it runs stage one, it saves the output, and then it also sends that output uh, along to stage, the same output along to stage two. And that can run and save the final output. Um, so, um, say we go and run this, and then we say make a change to stage two, or say we make no change. In either case, um, we would want to not run stage one again. It just you know, stays, stays where it is. We load the output that we had previously saved from stage one, feed it into stage two, and only run stage two to produce our final output. Um, that's what we would like. Um, but we also want, if for some reason, stage one is different now. Um, we want to save to a new place. Um, we want to treat this as if we're running this for the same time and disregard the old intermediate results. Um, so when we, when we do this, this, we, this is, we would like this to somehow that this is no longer a problem once we've changed this. And we want stage two to get the new, the new results, not the old ones. Um, so how do we do this? Um, so one of the, 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 the key problem here is we want to be saving and loading to the right, the appropriate paths here. We have to have some way to generate paths that reflect um, what the behavior we want. Um, so these paths, we want them to stay the same when you know, kind of nothing has changed, when it's just like this is redundant computation that we can avoid. And we want them to be different 
when there is, is when it's not redundant computation, when there's actually a change that we have to recompute something for the first time. Um, so, uh, so now think about this. Um, what defines an RDD? Um, so this is also this works for data frames and data sets as well. So the what defines the resilient distributed data set are the dependencies it depends on and some kind of logic you apply to those. So some there's for uh, for a given RDD, it might have zero or more dependencies. Um, usually it has one or two, but there are things like a source RDD will have zero be technically because it's just like it just has a path that it's reading from. It doesn't have a previous RDD that it depends on. But you more typically um, you have something like a, uh, you know, you're taking one RDD, you're mapping a function over it in order to produce another RDD. And one of the key things, um, the key, key takeaways here is if we pretend we don't have this, whatever this is, we know that if we know what this is and we know what this is, we will know kind of uniquely what this is going to be. Or at least even if we haven't computed it yet, um, we can say something about it that if we change either of these things, that this could potentially be different. And if we don't change either of these things, that it's definitely going to be the same. And I guess there's a caveat there. If we have in our logic here some kind of non-deterministic behavior, of course the gar that guarantee goes out the window. Um, but then again, if you if you have the same, not like if you have a non-deterministic thing, I would hope that you would be okay with a previously saved non-deterministic thing, um, and generally, usually good to avoid non-deterministic behavior in these sorts of systems, especially because of how RDDs work, where they'll recompute things. Um, generally, something to avoid, anyways. Um, so now, what we'd like here is we would like to generate some kind of identifier or signature. Um, so we want, um, if a result is, is a logic applied to some number of dependencies, um, we want the signature of that result to be a combined hash of the signature of the dependencies um, plus the hash of the logic we're applying, and then hash that all together in a deterministic fashion. Um, so more concretely, with like kind of a simple example here and some pseudocode, um, if we have RDD1, we map some function f over it to produce RDD2, the signature of RDD2 should be the signature of RDD1 plus the hash of the function and then hashed, um, hashed together. Uh, and then if we have something where we have some kind of source ID that is loading some kind of path, all we really have to do is hash that path and maybe some like we throw some constant in there to, di to differentiate what, uh, what kind of source type it is. Um, so now I just kind of casually mentioned here, oh yeah, just hash the function, it's fine. Um, but that's not really an obvious thing to do, and there's, there's not like a built-in way to just hash a function in most languages. Um, so I'm going over, this is you know, mostly, mostly about Scala, but similar things apply in Python, and there are in other languages as well. Um, so uh, in Scala, when you have um, one of these functions that's defined, and typically when you uh, map things in RDDs, it's you're using like an anonymous function, and all the anonymous functions in Scala will compile into a particular class. It has its own class that goes away in your class files. Um, and if you hash those bytes, that is a decent way of kind of capturing the logic, uh, capturing the identity of that logic. Um, and if you go and change, change these things, the, the, there will be some difference in the class file. And if you hash that, those bytes again, um, they'll, be, they'll come out different, which is the kind of behavior we want. Um, so for kind of simple examples like this, this is fine. Um, but the tricky part is when you have uh, dependencies on other functions or static methods or runtime values. So if we have something, uh, a function that refers to some um, object that has a, uh, has a value that might be different depending on, at different times, 
if we have um, referenced some static method that's defined somewhere else, and we reference perhaps another anonymous function. If any of those things change, we need to recognize a change in f. And if you go and simply look at the class file for f, um, it will not reflect changes if, if any of these change, unless the, the names of these things change. But if the definitions of them change, we wouldn't know it just by looking at the class file for f. Um, so we have to actually follow these dependencies. We want to identify all the class files that a particular function depends on, um, and also any kind of runtime values that the logic also depends on. Um, and then make a combined hash of all of those things. And if any of them change, we know like our function could potentially produce different behavior, and we want to, to know the difference between when nothing has changed and when something has potentially changed. Um, so um, assuming that can all be done, we still have some work to do. Um, if we're able to, like for stage, one, for stage one output, if we can generate a signature for that, um, in order to save that to a path so that when we modify it, um, it'll, it'll go to a different thing. Um, we still have to have um, some kind of way of switching these things in and out um, because we want to identify when this is present um, that we want to use it, and if it's not present, we need to actually compute this fresh. And there's, uh, you know, there are, there are you know, how, sh how should we switch these in? So we, there's a couple of options that we could try to do. We could try to make, make a change like this in, in core Spark in order to, to make this happen. Um, or we could try to build an abstraction on top of Spark um, where, the, where we handle the switching in of, of these, these checkpoints or the um, freshly computed results. Um, so uh, I th for, for reasons that, well, that will also become evident you know, later in this talk, um, I've opted to do the second option to just build an abstra abstraction on top of Spark, um, and it's also it, you know it's it's uh, it's useful because is if you're you know it's good to be f the, the APIs on Spark are pretty stable, so you can rely on that more so than you know kind of like below the API where things are, are a little more volatile, um, and also get into various reasons for for why I've decided to go with abstraction. So um, here's an abstraction I've, I've put together, and that is called a distributed collection. And distributed collection, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of just a, another one of these generic terms for some kind of partitioned data set. Um, and it pretty much does, it has the same API as RDDs, uh, data sets, and data frames. I've, it actually kind of encompasses um, all of those APIs. Um, and so you can do your maps, you can do your flat maps, you do your group buys, and so on. Um, and one of the key things here is you can make this, you can specify the definition of your pipeline without having a Spark context at the start. Um, so instead of starting with a Spark context, defining your things, you know, running your program like that, you start with your definition. You start with your, the definition of your pipeline, um, and then at the end, you pass in your Spark context in order to get it to produce the results you want. Um, so you can always go back to Spark by just um, you know, calling like get RDD or get data set and passing in a Spark context uh, at, you know, any one of, at, at any point. Um, so, and one of the key things is that we compute the, the logical signature um, before we've materialized the, 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 the actual data sets here. Um, so that means that we don't, you know, we can, we can, we can load checkpoints from as late as possible. So like, in, you know, kind of when the program starts, it'll very quickly kind of lay out the definition, have the signatures, be able to know whether checkpoints are present or not. And then when you ask it for things, it doesn't have to start at the beginning, it can start closer to the end. Um, so here's a, here's a simple example. So the API is basically the same, except the, the key difference here is like in regular Spark, we start with a Spark context. In this, we're starting with, you know, kind of a, a function call that will return um, a distributed collection, and you know if we you know also we could instead do a text file and stuff. So it would kind of this is still it, this is keeping with kind of the Spark lazy model. In fact, it's it's slightly more lazy um, in that you know kind of it's not really doing any work while you're laying down these definitions. And the difference, and if you 
go back to Spark in order to get your final thing. It's just a matter of calling, calling get RDD um, and passing in a Spark context. Um, so, um, and then if we have things like this, we can call checkpoint at any point and it should do the behavior we want if we run this successful, successively. Um, so now there is a problem, and this is also one of the main reasons that I opted to do this in abstraction rather than changing core Spark, is because, so this is, a, this is just regular native Spark um, here, but it illuminates um, an issue, and this is something that people will regularly have um, pipelines that um, incorporate things like this, and that is, um, so in this, we are starting with some numbers, um, we, we turn them into doubles, and we calculate a sum. And then we normalize these numbers such that they add up to one, and we do that by mapping a function over them where we divide them by the sum. So one key takeaway here is the definition of this function depends on us having this value for sum, and we can't get that value without actually doing potentially a lot of computation. I mean, here it's not really much, but imagine that this was loading some path where there's a lot of stuff. So there are all kinds of, of times that you have some situation like this, like maybe you're generating some kind of mapping and, and, and then you want to use, you're generating some kind of mapping by doing some, some behavior in Spark and you're, you're calling some action in order to get some mapping and then you use that mapping in, in one of your functions that you're, you're, you're running over every element in another RDD. Um, so stuff like this happens. And one key problem here is we can't, you can't compute the signature of this until you have it, and you can't have it until you compute this. So this is, this is an issue. So a way that, um, the way we can deal with this and still get the checkpointing we want is to use, a, use an, another abstraction called a deferred result. So this is like a distributed collection, except it only ever has one thing in it. Um, and um, it's also lazy. It doesn't actually compute anything until you pass in a Spark context or until something that needs it um, kind of you know, asks for it. And um, it also has a logic, logical signature. And with this, we can express pipelines like in an entirely lazy fashion. Um, so uh, in this example, um, we've changed, we changed it now so that um, we're, we're using DCs and when we call sum, instead of actually just getting a double, we get this DR of parameterized by type double. So we, have, um, we don't have the answer yet here, but we have kind of a plan to get it. Um, and then, so instead of where before we did this in one step, where we just did a map and we're passing in the sum, now we're doing this in two steps so that we can incorporate the result um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a, a general way. So um, there, there could be um, things where we get to like map with result, where we kind of pass in both things. But this is just kind of a general form here where we can do whatever at this point. So this is basically zipping each element of doubles with this result. And then you're in the position where you're now passing in a function that accepts a tuple of your original elements and the sum, and then you can perform, you can you can make this definition here. And this definition does not depend on you actually having any of these answers ahead of time. It's just something that you can specify immediately, which means that you can um, compute a signature of that function, um, which means that now we could checkpoint this or anything that depends on it. And we don't have to redo this, this, this sum in order to kind of g calculate um, our signature. Um, so what, did, what was the whole point of, of going through this? Um, so the, the, reason, the, reason to go to all, the reason I've gone to all this trouble is because uh, it would be nice if we could have things that run quickly, um, kind of are robust to changes, and we don't have to um, do redundant computation, uh, but it would be nice if we didn't also we didn't solve that by creating new problems. So, um, so we want to have the benefits of you know avoiding all of this redundant computation. We want to get the that speed. Um, we want kind of a, a nice nice workflow, but we also don't want to just save all these intermediate results everywhere and have to manually manage them ourselves. Um, and you know one of one. You know, kind of one nice thing about this is it's, it's, it's automatic um, and kind of you, you can just rely on it. 
you can have multiple people so that, that are working on overlapping sections of things where they change some, of, some part of their code, but it's, you know, usually you kind of have people having the same, like, you know, kind of basic input, and then people will branch out in terms of what, they, that, what they're doing. Um, and this is nice because they can make changes like this and, and test them out without having to worry if they're stepping on someone's toes. Because if you go and, you know, if you're not doing like something like this, if you're making changes, if you're making code changes and testing them out, you really don't want to be stepping on someone's toes, like overriding their immediate results with something that's actually different. So this is, you know, some safety on that in case you, you are working with several people on like a staged pipeline. Um, and so another reason beyond the automatic checkpointing um, is why like creating like a lazy definition um, is useful is because there are other kinds of automatic behaviors that you might want to do. Um, so one of the, one of the examples um, is, you know, imagine you, when you go and encounter problems, which it's just like maybe one in 10,000 elements are having issues or, you know, kind of erroring. One of the first thing, kind of the, there's a few simple steps that almost everyone would do in order to diagnose it. They'll maybe um, filter out to select just the failures and perhaps like do some distinct on them, um, count how many they are, how, show a few examples. And, but they usually do this after, after it's happened. They usually like will run something, they encounter a problem, they see where the problem is, they write some new code in order to isolate and select um, those issues, and then go and run that and diagnose it further. But all of that could have actually happened the first time. We actually could have, um, if, we're, if we kind of have this lazy plan, and we're already doing some switching in and out um, for checkpoints, we could, without so much trouble, um, do something like that, where we, uh, on the time it runs, it'll, it'll also kind of wrap a try catch around the, the function that might be erroring. And if there are issues in that, it can isolate those and have those and some statistics about those the first time it encounters it, instead of having to go back and, and isolate them further. Um, so can you use this? And the answer is yes. Um, so very recently, um, we've uh, opened up the, the repository on GitHub. Um, it requires Spark 2.0. It's data set backed. Um, this is still kind of early. It's not on Spark packages yet, but I'm hoping to put it there. Um, so it does require you to build it locally. Um, and you're all welcome to use it. And I would appreciate um, any kind of questions or feedback um, about it. Um, so, so yeah, does anyone have any questions? Hmm. Yes. Um, so the question was, if I have a Spark pipeline, I would need to rewrite it completely in order to use it. And the answer is, Mostly not, because it has pretty much the same API. So you would have to, depending on how many like signatures you have, uh, or uh, kind of like type signatures you have throughout, throughout it, you would have to change some type signatures if you refer to like RDDs and stuff. But for the mo most part, it's, it's, uh, it's the same API. So you, if you have like a, you know, sections of code where you're taking in something, um, mapping it, flat mapping it, grouping by, you could, um, you could just change, it, depend, it depends on how your code is structured, but it's mainly just like the, any kind of type signatures that have an RDD or like a data set, um, you, would ha you would have to switch those. Um, and yeah, some stuff like that. Yes? Yes, uh, so the question was, what kind of storage do you use for checkpoints? And yeah, I kind of got glossed over that. But by default, it'll just use the default file system in like slash temp slash spark flow with a path that also has like the, the signature in, as part of it. Um, and so you whatever your default file system is, which is typically going to be HDFS, um, that's what you would, would use. Um, it's actually best if you use something like Eluxio, um, and which actually, that's the, that's the next talk. Um, so, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you can use whichever, you can also just change the default checkpointing directory to whatever kind of file system you want. Uh, 
Uh, yes. So um, the question was, what sort of performance overhead does it have to, um, for the checkpointing? And so one of the, the key things is this is mostly a tool for, to improve the speed of development. So when you have, you've kind of sorted out the kinks in your pipeline, you would probably want to run it in a mode where it doesn't save checkpoints, it doesn't like check for checkpoints, it just runs all the way through, which is typically how you would run something in production. Um, and, uh, but while you are working with development, while it is using the checkpoints, the, the overhead is, is going to, it depends, so by default it saves in parquet, um, which is pretty, pretty good as far as, um, you, know, save, you know, kind of saving and loading. And it'll be better if you use some, like an off heap in memory store like Alexio, um, but HDFS with parquet is pretty good. And it's usually, it, it's usually, ch I mean, if you can, you can kind of go in somewhere where you really over checkpoint. If you checkpoint every every step along the way, that's probably not great. But it's typically best if you do it like after the results of shuffles. And so I have kind of um, shown you some things where it's kind of manual. This the specification of where the checkpoints are are kind of manual, but the the handling them is automatic. The there is there are some ways to have the whole the actual specification of the checkpoints be automatic, and that would probably be like after the after the results of shuffles typically. Sorry, we have to we have to continue okay. the next talk. So. We can we we can talk after. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.